I think it's possible to brainwash, manipulate, coerce people to do just about anything. And we see this demonstrated in military training or in uh, the kind of conditioning that people go through when they get involved in cults. And they do things that are uh, certainly way outside of the normal parameters of what they would consider moral. Nowhere was this more evident than in the small South American country of Guyana in the winter of 1978. The place was called Jonestown. On the surface, it appeared to be a gathering of ethnically diverse families assembled by the Reverend Jim Jones to live their dream of a racially harmonious society. This reporter spoke to many Jonestown people. They all insisted that it was a peaceful and productive place in which to live. Are you happy here? Oh, well, I should say I am. I've never been any happier in my life. Despite the outward appearance of normality, reports of sexual abuse, torture, and members being held against their will filtered back to the United States. San Francisco Congressman Leo Ryan flew to Guyana to investigate the allegations. I'm very glad to be here. This is a congressional inquiry. I think that all of you know that I'm here to find out more about uh, questions that have been raised about your operation here. But I can tell you right now that from the few conversations I've had with some of the folks here already this evening, that uh, whatever the comments are, there are some people here who believe that this is the best thing that ever happened to them in their whole life. The events of the following day would shock the world. Love is the only weapon. Shit! Bullshit! Martin Luther King died with love! Kennedy died talking about something you couldn't even understand sometimes! love and he never even backed it up he shut down bullshit love is the only weapon with which i got to fight i got a hell of a lot of weapons to fight i got my claws i got compasses i got guns i got dynamite i got a hell of a lot to fight i'll fight i'll fight Some 20 years later, Jonestown still raises as many questions as it does answers. Was it a mass suicide or a mass murder? Was it a mind control experiment gone awry? Was the CIA somehow involved? While still a teenager, Jones established a pulpit on the street corners of Richmond, Indiana, where he sold monkeys door to door in order to fund his activities. There he came to know a juvenile police officer named Dan Matron whose improbable path Jones would cross and recross in the years ahead. By the late 1950s, Jones had married his high school sweetheart, Marceline, and established an interracial church based in Indianapolis. He called it the People's Temple. At first, the church prospered, but Jones had a secret life. Matrone left Richmond and joined a sometime CIA cover at the State Department. Coincidentally or not, Jones suddenly became of deep interest to the most clandestine department of the agency, whose activities included mind control experiments, attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro, and operations to infiltrate and disrupt black organizations. For reasons that the CIA has always refused to explain, they opened a secret file in Jones' name. Suddenly, Jones abandoned his church, and armed with two passports, the young charismatic preacher traveled to a series of political hotspots, Mexico, Cuba, Guyana, and Brazil. Though he spoke no Portuguese, in 1962, Jones moved to Belo Horizonte, a small town in Brazil. With no apparent means of support, he rented an expensive house and began to make in-depth studies into voodoo, faith healing, mass conversion, and ESP, a key investigative element of the CIA's mind control program. But Jones was not the only person there from Richmond, Indiana. He later bragged of visits to his neighbor, Dan Matrone. 
The former police chief was now working for a sometime CIA cover at the U.S. consulate, training Brazilian police in the subtleties of hostile interrogation. Jones was also contacted by another key member of American intelligence at that time, John Lodison, who'd been kicked out of the Soviet Union for spying. In Brazil, he met with Jones for reasons that the CIA still refuses to explain. But Jones' stay in Brazil did not last. He left the country soon after a newspaper article appeared claiming he was a CIA agent. Returning to the USA, Jones moved the People's Temple to Northern California, where its membership grew rapidly. Jones flourished in San Francisco's cult-worshipping atmosphere. Membership in his People's Temple swelled to nearly 20,000 as his reputation grew and he started food kitchens and daycare centers. He particularly targeted minorities. Believing that the ends justified the means, he put on fake displays of healing and said that he was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Using classic brainwashing techniques, he bound his followers to him so that they willingly gave him whatever property and money they had. I can't imagine the importance of privacy. You know, the most discriminated against perhaps of any group. And I really don't feel comfortable with our wish of being photographed. I really don't. I must go against the entire council. I don't feel good about it. I can, I, they can photograph me all they choose, because I do not care. I'm fearless. I come unafraid of anything, but I don't want the cameras focusing on others. I don't want them. Focus on me all you want. I owe something to my people, and that's to be a good pastor, and that I am. The best I am. His services were dazzling affairs, with soul and gospel singers, dance groups, and celebrity preachers like black revolutionary Angela Davis. The size of his congregation gave him a political power base. During the 1976 presidential election campaign, he allegedly provided support for the Democrats and met the presidential candidate's wife. Local politicians sought his support, and he became a member of the city's housing commission. People from all walks of life were just fascinated by Jim Jones. I mean, I remember going to a testimonial dinner. Who is there at the dinner? You got Angela Davis, the communist, and then you have Walter Hetty, the chairman of the John Birch Society. And then you had the lieutenant governor of the state of California, you had the mayor, you had the DA, you had the chief of police, you had the supervisors, you had businessmen. They were all there at this meeting, and I thought, Jim, you got your act. He'd bring together. all of these people in, and he himself would come in in the midst uh, of a smaller uh, a retinue of, uh, of aides. They'd uh, shoo him to the front of, a, of the room, put him on uh, the center of the chair, and, and basically sort of guard him the whole time. Guys in dark glasses, black suits, the whole thing. It was very unusual. Jonestown was in its fourth year when Jones arrived in 1977. Conditions had never been easy, but when he took over, the agricultural mission became a labor camp. Jim had armed guards. I mean, young men who, and women who were told that they needed to watch everybody. And it kept you working hard. We headed out to the fields. And you vied to go really far out, actually, because you couldn't hear Jim over the loudspeakers. Jonestown was wired with loudspeakers. And Jim spoke 24 hours a day on it. When he wasn't speaking, the tapes that they'd made of him speaking played on and on. And, on. and Jim would make these announcements, and he'd say, I'm sending out some children and some, some of my aides, 
and other people you won't know who they are to pretend they want to leave. And it's a test. It's a loyalty test. And if anyone comes to you, you're to report them. You didn't know who it would be, so you just never put the place down and it, how much you enjoyed it there, how much you loved the place and how great he was and, and how father was so nice and you had to call him father. You just never said anything bad about the place because if you did, you would be coming up there that night. They also told of full-scale rehearsals for mass suicide in the jungle. I'll talk to psychiatrists, whatever, but I believe I was brainwashed. But we do understand that it, it's uh, extremely difficult for anyone to comprehend people being in a cult group, standing by, watching their daughter being beat 75 times as I did, watching children being beat, microphones held to their mouth while they're screaming so that the, everyone throughout the building that are not in a public meeting can hear them scream also. Uh, going through electric shock, treatment where they're screaming uh, it's incredibly difficult for anyone to believe a story like this there are SWAT teams consisting of 50 young men and women dressed in khaki there's two teams of 25 each that armed that are armed with uh, 200 to 300 guns and that they patrol all day and all night the whole encampment and that Jim Jones has stated publicly that nobody better try to escape from here because you will be shot the methods that Jim Jones used in his cult, the People's Temple, are definitely classical mind control techniques. And according to a book by Michael Myers, which is called Was Jonestown a CIA Medical Experiment? His documentation leads him to conclude that actually Jonestown was run by the CIA. Prior to being Jonestown in the deep jungles of British Guiana, that site was actually under control of what was called the Shalom Project. This was a CIA program for training black mercenaries for warfare in Angola. I'd gone through a false uh, mass suicide. I, I went through one talk and I went through one where we actually took a drink and we were told we had an hour to live so that Jones could find out how people would react psychologically. Turning Jonestown's children against his own enemies was standard practice for Jim Jones, and it delighted him. I like to kill gray stone. And Tim Stone. I'll go back and do it right now. I think that I should take a knife and cut Mr. Tupper all up real good. And uh, put poison him and invite all, all my relatives over there and have them eat him and then I'll die. <laughs> it was terror. It was living terror living inside Jonestown. Deborah Layton had escaped Jonestown a few months earlier with bizarre tales of mind control, armed guards, and suicide rehearsals. They are recounted in her new book, Seductive Poison. The suicide drills were the most frightening and disturbing things there, that we would be awakened from the middle of a dreamless sleep to Jim's voice screaming over the loudspeaker that, that we were going to die, that we had to come to the, to the pavilion, that mercenaries were coming in to kill us. She put her concerns in a sworn affidavit to the U.S. State Department months before Congressman Ryan's trip. Congressman Ryan and the journalists arrived in Guyana on Tuesday, November 14, 1978. Well, he was such a, a kind man, so compassionate, didn't get excited about nothing. Oh, it'll be okay. It'll be, it'll be fine. Just take it easy. It'll be fine. That's just the way he was. Mm -hmm. For some time, Ryan had been a thorn in the side of the CIA. He had recently pushed through congressional legislation that curtailed the agency's covert foreign activities. As Ryan prepared for a first-hand look at Jonestown, he was joined by a State Department agent, Richard Dwyer. What he didn't know was that Dwyer was working undercover. The man named Dwyer. Uh, was the head of the, the CIA. Yeah. I mean, the CIA had a presence here. It was an unrevealed presence at the time. I had a premonition about the trip. It, it, there was something that just made me feel a great deal of um, uncertainty. In 1978, Jackie Spear was the legal aide to San Francisco area Congressman Leo Ryan. They were about to embark on a fact-finding trip to look into reports of abuse and brainwashing at the remote jungle compound known as Jonestown. I, I always kind of um, shake my head in disbelief when they refer to it as a suicide. Those people, 
were not in control of their minds. They had been brainwashed. The next day, 20 Temple members decided they wanted to leave. In a haze of drugs, Joan's world began to fall apart. Jones reacted angrily when shown a note from a cult member asking the party for help to get away. Someone came and passed me this note. Well, that's who we're talking about. He wants to leave his son here. If Jones sounds such a bad place, why does he want to leave his son here? He's the one that I'm just talking about. Yeah, this is the man that wants to leave his son here. People what? play games, friend. They lie, they lie. What can I do about liars? Are you people going to leave us? I just beg you, please leave us. Bill, we will bother nobody. Anybody wants to get out of here can get out of here. We have no problem about getting out of here. They come and go all the time. I don't know what kind of game. People like, who, who, people like publicity. Some people do. I don't. But he said goodbye, apparently calmly. Then he whispered to one of his lieutenants. As the party reached the airport, a man with a knife tried to stab Ryan. The congressman described the attack. Yeah, he said uh, something about uh, rob and choke and kill and uh, or knife. I don't, I don't know. But the obvious, what he said was he intended to kill him. The party had now been joined by about 30 cult members who wanted to get away, and the enlarged party walked out towards the aircraft. Congressman Ryan went over to shake the pilot's hand. As the party waited, a tractor and trailer appeared in the background. Hidden men opened fire. Congressman Ryan, two reporters and an NBC cameraman were killed. Several other journalists and defectors were injured. One man who was not executed at the airstrip was Richard Dwyer, the undercover CIA man from the American Embassy, seen here peeling off from Ryan's party seconds before the tractor arrives. Where Dwyer was in the next few hours is key to one of the mysteries that still lies at the heart of the Jonestown tragedy. Having dealt with Congressman Ryan, Jones now turned his insanity on the temple's faithful. At this point in time, Jonestown had become surreal. Almost everything that was going on seemed surreal to me. I mean, by this time, I pretty much figured out this, this guy was mad. But he said, I've never, never seen or felt Jonestown so peaceful or quiet. And I remember getting a chill just course through my body because Jonestown had never been in more agony, had never been so less together. From his seat in the pavilion, Jones recorded the last desperate hour of the People's Temple. In front of him, more than 900 of his followers, who were surrounded by guards holding rifles and crossbows. For all but a few, there was no escape. Subsequent medical examinations revealed that many of the dead had been murdered, held down, and injected with cyanide. Jones himself was one of the last to die. A single gunshot to the head sometime around midnight. His killer has never been known. At 3.30 in the morning when everyone was dead and several hours before anyone arrived, a radio message was sent from Jonestown using a secret CIA channel reporting what it described as a mass suicide. This was the message that shaped our view of Jonestown for years to come, even though the best medical evidence suggests that most of those who died had been murdered. The question then becomes who sent that message. The only functioning radio in the area belonged to the local American intelligence officer, Richard Dwyer. Though he always denied going back to Jonestown that night, the last tape tells a very different story. Take Dwyer on down to the east house. Get Dwyer out of here before something happens to him. Though more than 900 Americans had died, Richard Dwyer and other U.S. Embassy officials would later receive medals and promotions. A 
multi-million dollar lawsuit was subsequently filed by Congressman Ryan's daughter and the relatives of those who died. The suit described the deaths as a massacre and alleged that Jones was an agent or operative of the Central Intelligence Agency. It was dismissed on a technicality and never tried. Here's more from Bob Jimenez in Diana. Recovery teams have been removing the dead from Jonestown since Wednesday. Today, as the recovery operation neared what appeared to be the end, the miscalculation was realized. There were not 400 bodies as first thought, but nearly twice that number. Some were found alongside a temple where recovery teams were just starting to work. Air Force Captain John Muscatelli talked to reporters. The original count of persons found dead at the Jonestown site has been found to be seriously in error. It now appears there may be as many as 780 bodies total found at the site. They were found simply buried under other bodies. There were larger adults that were grouped together, and under their bodies were found the bodies of smaller uh, adults and children. But the medical team were not the only people in Jonestown that day. During the immediate aftermath, Jeff Brilly was approached by a man in civilian clothes who asked him to guard a large box of documents. And he said, I'm from the U.S. Embassy. If anybody tries to take this box away from me, shoot them. And I said, uh, you've got to be out of your mind. I'm not going to shoot anybody. And he told me that the box was full of sensitive documents and he needed to get those to the U.S. Embassy. I think he probably was CIA. The documents then disappeared into the CIA and their contents remain secret to this day. Twenty years later, the CIA continues to deny any interest in the People's Temple. They claim that their own file on Jones is empty. But new evidence reveals startling connections between Jones and members of the U.S. intelligence community. It began with a visit to Guyana by Congressman Leo Ryan, some of his staff, and members of the press. He was later killed, along with four other Americans, including Don Harris and Robert Brown of NBC News. After the killings, the Guyanese authorities impounded the first tapes and notes made by the NBC crew. appeared on a uh, public television uh, several months ago with a group of uh, black professionals, mostly uh, psychologists and doctors. They invited me to appear today to provide information that they thought might be, uh, that I might be able to help with this forum today, with their research. Uh, I appeared in Washington in February before the International Relations Committee and uh, made some statements and some charges and documentation which resulted in the Foreign, Relations, Foreign Affairs Committee, or International Relations Committee, whatever they call it, today. Uh, they voted to ask the House Select Committee on Intelligence to investigate my charges. And they are currently investigating those charges by the House Select Committee on Intelligence. Can you tell us what the charges are? Well, the charges basically appoint mine to uh, CIA contact with both the Burnham government there and with the People's Temple. Uh, that originally, it was my belief at the time I went to Washington, that the purpose of our involvement there was to support the government of Burnham for a commercial reason, and uh, they used the People's Temple almost as enforcers to help support an unpopular government there to keep control of the government of Guyana. Uh, the, we knew that the, there had been an article in the San Mateo Times in December of 79 which indicated that the deputy chief of mission there, Richard Dwyer, uh, was in fact the CIA station chief. He was the one that went to Jonestown with Leo's party, and he claimed to be slightly wounded, but there was a tape made at the time of the murders and suicides there, with Jones yelling, get Dwyer out of here, get Dwyer out of here. And the indications are that it was Dwyer who went back into Jonestown after Leo was murdered and was there at the time. And there's great question is just who shot Jim Jones and why, whether Jones was shot to shut him up. Uh, the question also as to how all these people died and just when they died, which is all documented here. But soon I came back from Washington because of my testimony. I started getting documentation from a Berkeley psychologist called the Penal Colony here and from the Alliance for Preservation of Religious Liberty in Washington 
which indicated other things, one of which was that George Philip Blakey uh, was a top Jones aide. He was the man who arranged the purchase or the lease of the land in Guyana, provided the money and arranged the lease down there in 1974. He also was tracked now as being a CIA operative in uh, Angola in 1975 with Unita. He's also, he's also the same guy who was the top aide who arranged all this purchase in the finances, is also the husband of Deborah Layton Blakey, who fled Jonestown and made those charges. He's a brother-in-law of Larry Layton, who was, who was acquitted yesterday. And it's interesting to note, the Peninsula Times Tribune says, yesterday, the jury appeared, uh, in acquitting Layton, the jury appeared to have agreed with the defense contention that Layton was brainwashed and drugged at the time of the shootings could not be held criminally responsible. But the gist of what I'm getting to is this. I've received a lot of documentation, which I will allow you to hear today, that indicates the, poss the strong possibility that Jonestown and the People's Temple was in reality a mass mind control experiment conducted by the CIA as a follow-up to something called MK Ultra, which they conducted from the early 50s through 1974. They used to use the VA hospital and state hospitals. They used the federal and state penitentiaries for their experiments. Do you think that Jim Jones was actively involved with the CIA? I do now. Do you have any conclusions as to how the people died in Jonestown? Yes, uh, I have part of our documentation here uh, is a report from, uh, which is uh, attached here. The chief medical examiner in Guyana is a Dr. Leslie Moto. He reported, and this is attached here, his opinion that more than 700 of those bodies found at Jonestown were not suicide victims but were murdered. They have repeat based this on the injection marks in the upper arm. Page four of my, of my uh, statement here. By injection, I guess? Yes, and by, and by, uh, sh and, and by uh, gunfire. There were a lot more people killed by gunfire than they've ever admitted so far. We had heard reports that there, had, there were 50 of them, about 50 men with guns ringing around there so people couldn't get out, and very few of them did get out. Uh, so it's our, can, according to the uh, chief medical officer in Guyana, most of the people down there were murdered rather than suicide. Who is suppressing all of this? Are you uh, implying the CIA was active in the suppression? Yes, I'm suggesting to you that uh, a lot of things that don't make sense here. I'm suggesting that the long delay in anyone getting in, or the press getting in there, or very many people all getting in there for several days, was caused by a deliberate attempt to manufacture the story, which has now been accepted and sold successfully to the American people. And what is that story that you think the people are falsely accepting? That, in effect, this was a large group of uh, uh, disillusioned or uh, uh, rather uh, 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 disoriented black people who went down to Guyana and who turned their backs in this country and committed suicide and uh, we might as well we're good, we're, we're rid of them and that it's just sort of an aberration type of thing. I think that's the story that's been peddled. Uh, when you see the documentation here, you'll begin to wonder yourselves why the first reports were 350 people died or 400 people died. And for several days, that was reported, and many started finding more bodies. When the first reports were that 500 fled in the jungle, the people examined the bodies the first time and counted them, counted them by name, by number, heights of people, men, women, and children, turned them over. Then a few days later, they claimed to have found uh, two and three stacks of bodies underneath those. You know, it's, uh, it, it boggles the mind, the stories that were passed out, but they apparently have uh, gotten away with, I think, with one of the greatest fabrications of, of, of recent years. What significance do you attach to the fact that the leadership of the temple was largely white and the membership of the temple was largely black? I mentioned that in here. I think that that's part and parcel of the whole thing. I think that uh, this is what caused me very suspicious about this whole experiment, about, this whole, about the, the possibilities here. You know, the, the cadre was all white. And yet we think of Jonestown as a bunch of black people who were committed suicide without mentioning that white cadre. And that doesn't quite add up. I think, it's, I think there are racist overtones of the whole thing. What kind of racist overtones? What are you exactly alleging? I'm alleging that the media picture that was printed, uh, it was painted rather, and then brought a out in print and so on, was that uh, you don't have to worry about these people because they're crazy, they'll do anything, and they're not like us. It's my impression this time that they were conducting 
some sort of uh, mind control experiments. For example, they had a very modern hospital done, which they bragged about. So modern that in that population, they had medical checkups for, for everyone every day. So there's no need for that unless you're conducting experiments where you're having control groups and you're giving people, and they gave them their, they gave them their vitamins every day. And it's my guess that they were just using them as guinea pigs to see what they could do under isolated circumstances. They'd take them off into a jungle someplace far away from everybody, they get them there somehow, and then they're able to see how these various drugs work on different groups. Could you tell us about the details of the murders in Guyana, exactly how they were killed? Well, Dr. Mutu, the pathologist at the site in Jonestown, said that 70 to 80 percent of the bodies had a fresh needle mark in the back of the left shoulder blade at a point they could not have reached themselves, and that the body showed evidence of having been forced to take the shots. Um, and the official, official coroner's verdict from Matthews Ridge by the Guyanese judge and jury that looked into the situation was that all the people had been murdered, that not one had been a suicide. But two found evidence of gunshot wounds and strangulation in many of the other bodies. I studied about 150 pictures in which I could see gunshot wounds. There's no way that cyanide pathology explains the condition of those bodies all face down and you could see drag marks. And the body count went up because the area was surrounded by 350 Guyanese troops, about 200 British Black Watch troops, which are the equivalent of their Green Beret on maneuvers at Matthews Ridge in those days, and American Green Berets that came in with the body cleanup teams that spent the period of the five days murdering people, rounding them up in the jungle. The original reports were all 408 dead and then 700 flee into the woods. And the military said, first, the Guyanese can't count. Second, that it was bodies on top of bodies, though how you start with 408 and end up with 915 and say that the 400 covered the, the 500 makes no sense. They said bodies in little piles. They even said at the end, after they'd been there for six days, that they forgot to go around to the back of the pavilion and there were 500 bodies back there. I mean, this was the final official explanation, but these people were being killed. Yes, small in this room. There's an old junkie. Uh, from Detroit, who was a survivor of Jonestown, the guy who said he hid under the... Uh, Odell Rhodes. His name. What happened to him? Where is he now? I don't, I don't know where all the survivors are. Um, many of them survived because they cooperated with the plan and were meant to survive. That's, that's the case with the ba basketball team and other, and other people. Um, they were off somewhere. Well, they eventually got to Georgetown and eventually came back to the United States. Some of them were out on a ship. The ones that were on the boat with, Le uh, with Blakey went to uh, Trinidad. Then they went to Panama and emptied a $5 million bank account in Credit Suisse. And then they went to Grenada. They set up shop in Grenada, I believe, in the mental hospital there with Dr. Bourne and his father who worked in primate research with MK Ultra. And Bourne set up all the methadone programs in the United States for the Rockefellers. And uh, I think they were experimenting on the mental patients because that's the only building bombed in the in invasion of Grenada. And there's 180 people in the, in the, the inmates in the psychiatric institution murdered, dumped into a mass grave. And then the U.S. was going to send $400 million to rebuild the hospital. I mean, you know, I mean, they were going to make it a better unit to experiment on people after they got the right government in. Early on, a cocaine smuggling operation, because I, I, I believe... There were drugs and guns being smuggled in and out, and there were relations uh, of mercenaries. Some of these killers uh, were taken in and out of Angola. The CIA-backed UNITA forces by Blakey and ran mercenaries, and they did run guns and drugs, but the operation was primarily an extension of MK Ultra. People were taken off the streets uh, here in San Francisco out of the welfare rolls, from the elderly homes, from the, from the psychiatric institutions, from the prisons. Children were given as wards of the court and turned over into their control. They put them in, in buses. They took them to Miami, and I talked to an air traffic controller. When they landed in Guyana, all of the blacks were bound and gagged coming off of the plane. People five miles away didn't even know there were blacks at 
Jonestown. All they had ever seen of People's Temple were the white crew that was running it, going in and out of the cities. They were buying Guyanese babies from women wherever they could give a blanket or something for a baby and taking them back in there. And there was massive experimentation. There were enough drugs on site to drug the population of Georgetown, Guyana, over 120,000 for more than a year for a population of 1,200 people in this camp. And Dr. Schock, who I believe survived, he's not in the first death list. He's added to the second. I think he's related to Hallmar Schock, to the Mike Reich's Minister of Finance, who, who developed the, 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 the phrase, Arbeit macht frei, work makes you free at the, at the Auschwitz camp. And they came to, to Houston. That's where the Schock family ended up. They were the big bankers for Hitler. And this guy is from Houston, and he was not a doctor. He was described as doing, uh, you know, suturing on wounds without anesthesia and all kind of sadistic things and they had medical tags you can see even in Time magazine medical tags on the people but an order came down from Zbigniew Brzezinski through Hague to Robert Pastor on site to strip bodies of all identification and tags Then the bodies are left in the sun to rot so that no fingerprints, no identification can be done from the tags and no autopsy can be done, fluid or otherwise by the time they get back to the United States so you can never find out what killed them or how many drugs they had in the body. They had one footlocker there with 11,000 doses of Thorazine. And the drugs that are described are the exact drugs that were used for 30 years in MK Ultra in the different control scenarios. With a past that's littered with so many shattered lives and a trail of mental torture, the challenge of the new millennium will be learning how to best protect ourselves from mind control. Somehow, the average citizen thinks that his or her mind could never be manipulated. And yet every day, we're manipulated by each other. We're manipulated by advertising. A thousand things impact and manipulate us in different ways. We're bombarded with messages from the media, the radio, the television, and from newspapers that shape our perceptions of the world. This relentless yet subtle conditioning can develop without you even knowing it. Uh, watching television is a trance-like experience. You forget about the carpet, the curtains, and that you're sitting in a room, and you engage your experience directly into the television screen so that whatever happens on the screen seems really real. You, know, you suspend belief in reality. If you don't take responsibility for what goes into your mind, somebody else will. Cult leaders, politicians, advertisers will all seek to implant their message in your mind, whether it's for your good or not. The greatest battle of the 21st century will be a battle of the mind. And there are people who have power who want more power, and they do not want the public to know about mind control, its existence, or how it's implemented. There is a body of information being used by government to control the way people think and act, and experiments are systematically designed to increase government's knowledge about that. This is the most threatening part of being a citizen in a democracy. When your government can manipulate how you vote and how you think, you no longer live in a democracy.